in the supernatural evangelism. Why don't you open your Bibles in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8. We all know that scripture very well. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And I literally believe when the apostles, you know, when, when he was talking about the end of the earth, he should have put Australia in quotation marks. He was talking about Australia right there. How many of you know that he was talking about Australia? And the, the end times revival that we are expecting, the, the revival that has been prophesied over many decades, has a strong correlation with Australia. Australia is in God's agenda. Oh no, you should be more excited than that. I said Australia is in God's agenda. And God is about to move in this nation. And so he's looking for a generation of people, men and women, who are going to walk in the, in the, in the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. The dunamis, you know, that is the Greek word. The dunamis, which is the power from, uh, on, from high. The power from above. So when you, when you want to flow in the supernatural evangelism, you're going to have to realize that it can only be manifested. You know, signs, wonders, and miracles. And those are three things that we need to believe God. Signs and wonders will follow those who? Who? So sometimes you're going to have to take a jump of faith. Because in order to flow in supernatural evangelism, you're going to have to exercise your faith quite a bit. There is a risk factor involved. And if God says jump, you jump. And that is supernatural evangelism. There is, a, there is a simple, you know, obviously we all want to know what is the formula. What is the secret? How can we activate supernatural evangelism in us? All supernatural conversations must lead to Christ. Come on. And that should be the number one goal. Supernatural evangelism is not a mystical theory. Or a replacement of something that the world is already offering. It's the real power of God. So supernatural evangelism is not weird. It's not strange. It's not mystical. It's not, you know what I'm saying? It's not strange fire. It's real fire. And when we learn to embrace the the, the supernatural side of the kingdom. We can flow. The, the, the question is how can I activate the supernatural in me? How many of you live in a body of flesh? Come on, raise your hand. All of you, right? How many of you live in a corrupt, broken world that needs Jesus? How many of you know that we have to deal with our flesh on a daily basis? But how many of you know that even though we are natural beings, we have a supernatural God and we can walk in a supernatural world? Come on, raise your hand. So if you believe in the supernatural, you know, have you ever watched the show by Sid Roth? It is supernatural, natural. Do you love that? I love his show. I actually watch him quite a bit. Because I love his testimonies and the interviews and I love the teaching and I love everything he does for the kingdom. Because I believe in, in, in the supernatural. So in order to activate the supernatural in you, one must activate their faith. You cannot operate in the supernatural unless you walk in faith. You got to have faith in order to step out and do supernatural things for the Lord. Now, it's not going to be a, an overnight process. It's not going to be like you step out and you're raising the dead from the moment you're stepping out. And, and I mean, in God's sovereign will, God can do that. The first miracle, you pray for someone, someone gets raised from the dead. Hallelujah, that's awesome. But in, uh, in this world, 
God wants us to grow until we attain the fullness of his glory. Hello. Can I tell you that Jesus didn't raise anybody from the dead when he was 30? Think about that statement. When he started his ministry, when he began his ministry, he didn't raise anybody from the dead. In fact, the first miracle that Jesus did was, and you can read it, you know, the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. Remember that? Hello? And, you know, and, and, and some other miracles, right? Remember that story? Yeah, the water into wine, that's a supernatural miracle. But I'm talking about physical miracle. A physical miracle. The fever. Remember that story in the Bible? When Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law of fever. See, Jesus didn't start raising people from the dead from day one. In fact, let me tell you something. Can I, can I, can I press in here? You know why Mary turned around? You know why Jesus turned around and said to Mary, it is not my time? Why are you asking me? Why are you asking me to do this? Because it is not my time to manifest who I am before the world. Because he as the Son of God, understood that he needed to go through a process of learning before he could be manifested in fullness. Wow, come on. So one must go through a process of learning before you embrace the fullness. See, that's why God has a process for everything. The world created a microwave. Americans, you know, in America, you know, this great invention of the microwave, and we put things in a microwave, and they get cooked, and you, you can heat them up, and they're done. Hello? The first few weeks in Australia, we didn't have a microwave, and that was driving me insane. My wife was doing everything in the oven and cooking everything and, and putting, you know, and, and just cook and, and just heating up everything using the oven. I'm like, I want a microwave, you know. I'm almost like asking the Lord, provide so that we can get a microwave. And we just, you know, life gets in the way and we, we just get busy and we forget about it. And, you know, and, and, and sometimes you just don't, don't worry about it. And you, you start using other things. And then you realize, I don't really need a microwave. But one day, I saw a microwave on Facebook, a good deal. And I said, I'm going to get it. And I got it. And I'm very happy now with my microwave. I love my microwave. But God is not into microwaving his process in you. God is not into microwaving your growth, your spiritual growth. See, you need to understand that you're going to start from, a, you know, from a, a point, a beginning point. And when you pray for someone, you may not see a miracle the first moment. But don't be discouraged because God is stretching your faith. And the more you do it, the more you practice it. And the more you practice it, the more you exercise your faith. And the more you exercise your faith, sooner or later you are going to see a miracle happening before your eyes. Come on. So the more you do it, the more you will become acquainted. And the more you become acquainted with the anointing, the more comfortable you flow in it. How many of you know that if you go to the gym for the first time and you haven't been in the gym for 20 years, you need to become acquainted with the gym? Hello. Hi. You're going to see people in the gym that are so fit that are going to intimidate you. You step in there and you're like, oh, I think I'm in the wrong place. And you're going to turn around and, and, and feel like, I, uh, you're going to look at those guys, you know, they're like, you know, they're built. They're really like, they, you know, they're uh, uh, strong and, and they can do all this weightlifting and all of that. And then you're trying so hard, you know, to start somewhere. And you feel discouraged because you're looking at these guys who have been doing it for like 10, 15 years. They didn't get there overnight. See, no one is going to arrive at their destination point overnight. You've got to embrace the process. 
Come on, tell your neighbor, you got to embrace the process. You have to embrace the process. If you don't embrace the process, then you're going to crash. God wants you to embrace the process. So don't be afraid to step out in faith and pray for someone. Don't be afraid to, to be led by the Holy Spirit. And don't, you know, I know it's nerve-wracking. I know it's, 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 it's terrifying. I know it is a, a challenge. And I know that when you're going to do it, when you're going to be asked by the Lord to pray for someone, it's going to require faith. Say it with me, faith. If you don't have that, <laughs> then you're in trouble, right? You got to pray for someone you need. What, what do you need? What do you need? If we go to the, uh, the other slide, we're going to see that, we're going to see some disclaimers here. Supernatural evangelism must be rooted in a relationship with God. Spending time in God's presence. The leading of the Holy Spirit. And say it with me, the Word. Come on, say it with the Word. See, God wants you to, number one, build a relationship with Him. Through spending time in His presence. If you want to walk in supernatural evangelism, right? You need to, number one, understand that supernatural evangelism happens out of relationship with God. Supernatural evangelism happens out of exercising your faith. Supernatural evangelism happens out of you letting go of your, of your ego, your fear, your, you know, your, your uh, preconceived ideas and jumping in faith. Now, no one in this world... You know, unless, unless they have the wrong spirit, if you offer them prayer, most likely people will say, yes, I would love for you to say a prayer. How many times, and this is the way we start, and I'm going to give you a practical way of getting your supernatural evangelism started. We're going to get it started. How do we do it? Well, number one, we walk out of a relationship with God. Number two, we are, right, led by the Holy Spirit. We're not going to do it just because, oh, I so, you know, I so, I so taught why doing it in California, so I'm going to do it. Hello? Oh, I, I, I read about Peter, and so I'm going to do it. No, I'm going to be led by who? By who? So even if I see that others are doing it, I'm going to be led by who? Because if the Holy Spirit is not giving me a green light, don't do it. Hello? You need a green light from who? Because if you don't depend on the Holy Spirit, then it's going to become about you. It's going to become about how much you want to see it because you want to prove the point that Jesus is working through you. And it's not about you. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about the gospel. It's about rescuing the lost. Come on. And so I see a lot of people that get burned out. They crash. They, they often take off and crash because they keep doing the same thing. See, Jesus never healed people the same way. He often had many different mechanisms and strategies and ways of healing people. Why? Because he was led by who? The Holy Spirit 24-7. And even though he was the son of God, he would come down and talk to his disciples and say, I just came from the mountain and I was spending time with who? The father. Why do you think Jesus needed to spend time with the father if he was the son of God? He showed us the template. He showed us the way. He basically said, children... I want you to know, and basically that's what he said in the first phrase when he taught his disciples how to pray. And, you know, remember that prayer, our Heavenly Father? Basically, he taught them to depend on the Holy Spirit, on the Father, sorry, to depend on the Father and the Holy Spirit. You have a Father. You're not orphans. You are not widows. You have a Father, and your Father is God. Come on, how many of you believe in your Father? So if Jesus, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this suggestion, and I want you to take it before the Lord. If Jesus was the Son of God, if he is, obviously he is the Son of God, and he needed to spend time with the Father, how much do you think we need to spend time with Jesus? Hello. 
I want you to turn around and smile to someone and let that person know, let your neighbor know, I think God is talking to you. Come on. I think God is talking to us, right? We need to spend time with who? With the Father. With who? The Holy Spirit. If we want supernatural evangelism, we must rely on a, on, on a relationship with God, being led by the Holy Spirit, never doing it out of self. Never doing it out of the flesh. Never doing it out of self-promotion. Never doing it out of self-motivation. Never doing it out of, you know, I just want to do it. I want to try it out and see if it works. No, we got to be led by the Holy Spirit. If we don't feel led by the Holy Spirit, let's not go there. Because you're going to find out that it's not going to work. But if you're led by the Holy Spirit, unless, unless you know, God's grace is, is, is unfathomable. Amen. God's grace is something that you will never be able to understand. And even if you're doing it out of self and then it worked, it's because it was his grace. Hello. But you can't rely on that. See, because God, God is not interested in, in making you look good. God is interested in getting that person's life out of hell. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm going to say that again. He is not interested in making us look good. He is interested in saving the world. Come on. Jesus is interested in saving the lost. Come on. Jesus is interested in rescuing them in rescuing them because they're they're you know they're they're almost they're heading in the wrong direction. And I'm not afraid to say that word because I know this church is a Holy Spirit breathing church. And you guys preach about repentance, right? Don't you? Right? I know some churches that don't like to use the word hell. But let me tell you something. It is a, it's, it's a living place. And we are called to rescue people. Come on. We are called to reach them out. Are you called to reach them out? We are called to save them. There is a world that is, uh, that is hopeless. There's a world that is lost out there. And we need to walk by in the power of the Holy Spirit using the tools and the weapons God has given us to rescue this world. One time I was with my daughter and this is how I, 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 I you know, I like to mentor and I like to um, teach Cariel. Cariel is my six-year-old. And I like to teach her how to operate in the Holy Spirit. The first time I, I prayed for her, you know, and, and I was in my, in my office, and the Holy Spirit has said to me, I want you to invite your daughter into the office while I was having my prayer time. And I said, sure. And I was almost wrapping up the prayer time. Normally, I like to pray with worship, you know, and, and just getting into the zone. How many of you like to get in the zone? Amen. Like you're in the worship, you're in the presence of God, and you're almost lost. Amen? But lost in a good way because you're so overwhelmed by his presence. How many of you love his presence? Come on. You know? And so you're like in this worship, and then the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And then I feel like God's saying, I want you to bring Cariel. So I brought Cariel into the room. She's like, Daddy, what do you want? You know? Hey, what am I doing here? And, and, and I just said, Cariel, just raise your hands, close your eyes. And so I just prayed. And it stood behind her, and I just, you know, kind of... Uh, I just, I just felt like the Holy Spirit, you know, wanted me to stand there and just watch, you know. And, and she was like you know, raising her hand. She had no idea what was going to happen. And the next moment, I see her on the floor. The Holy Spirit knocked her down. The power of God filled her. And she couldn't, you know, she couldn't even stop it. Or, or you know, faith like children. They can't reason it. They just go for it. Amen. And sometimes we got to have that faith like children so we can operate in the supernatural evangelism. That's one disclaimer. <laughs> Write it down. Faith like children. Because children will do crazy things for the Lord. Amen. Faith like children. Because children will not hesitate. They will not doubt. They will not be afraid. They will just step out. If they're being led by the Holy Spirit, they will step out. So my daughter did it. So the other day we were in Panama and, uh, you know, we were walking out in the streets and, you know, uh, we were going to a grocery store and I was with another pastor and we were just walking past this lady who was laying 
on the you know on the street on the pavement uh you know and 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 I just felt the Holy Spirit said stop and just pray for her you know and and you gotta follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit you know so I stopped and and, and I noticed this lady you know had her arm wrapped in it you know uh, she probably had like her arm dislocated or something so she was like holding her arm like this and she had a little boy and so my daughter and I we were standing there with my my friend and we started we started talking to this lady we engaged in a conversation and the first thing we are offering here is prayer would you like some prayer and she said sure and so she accepted our prayer and so we we just we just lay hands on her gently and the power of God came upon her and imagine this happened like this she got healed on the spot Come on. So she's like lifting her hand. She's like, I have no pain. This is so weird. So in that moment, God is giving me an opportunity to lead her to Christ. Because when God uses us to heal the unbelievers, we're not just going to heal them and leave them standing there with the shock like, wow, something weird just happened. And uh, what do I do with this? And how am I going to process it? When God used you to heal an unbeliever, it's for you to lead them to Christ. So don't leave them hanging. Don't leave them halfway there. Don't leave them with just, a, 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 you know, the taste in their mouth. You need to lead them to Christ. And if they're not ready, then you keep sowing and you keep investing. And you keep, you know, you keep basically showing them the way. Amen. Because God is not, remember Jesus went to a lot of people and before he healed them, what did he say before he actually healed them? And he got them up and he, uh, you know, he basically raised them. What, what did he say? What was the first phrase before he healed them? Your sins are forgiven. Because that is the number one goal of the kingdom. God wants to heal the spirit. God wants to save the soul. He is interested in rescuing the lost. Come on. The number one mission of the kingdom is to rescue the lost. Come on, church. So if we are driven by that, if we are driven by rescuing the lost, then this is going to be the best way of growing our church. <laughs> Amen. Acts chapter 2 verse 43, then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing.